Well, thank you, Professor Carmody, and thank you for inviting me to be uh, giving this lecture. I feel humbled, given the panoply of <coughs> distinguished speakers who preceded me. I have to pay tribute to Professor Carmody, who's been a, a stalwart uh, at the Canada-U.S. Law Institute as the Canadian director, without whom we really wouldn't be where we are today. And I, I think, I think Western University and the faculty, for all they have done in supporting and promoting the activities of CUSLI, as we call it, the Canada-U.S. Law Institute. It's also a pleasure for me to be back here. I've judged a number of moot courts in this very, in this very room over the years, and have had uh, good, uh, good friends as deans and faculty members over the course of many years. So it's a great uh, pleasure to be back here. Uh, international law in a turbulent world. I have to confess that when I was preparing for this lecture, I assumed that the world largely would be continuing with the election uh, of Hillary Clinton uh, as president. The last week has changed a lot of things. Uh, it has changed what the U.S. has, I think, pursued with different levels of intensity over the years and called into question a lot of the assumptions that we uh, in the international field have had uh, regarding U.S. leadership and U.S. commitment uh, to the rule of law. We don't know where this particular election is going to take us, but the indications are unsettling, to say the least. So with some adjustments to what I had prepared up until last week, I, I still think the topic merits discussion. Uh, international law in a, in a turbulent world. It, it's, uh, I guess, a little presumptuous as a topic. Uh, it covers a vast number of issues, and we don't have time to go into all of those issues. So I am going to focus on two areas uh, and suggest where we've come and where we're going in two areas uh, of importance in the public international law domain, the law of the sea uh, and the law of international trade. So bear with me while I uh, go through a number of preliminary points, but I think necessary to set the stage for my discussion about where public international law is taking us. Um, very interesting for me as someone who joined the former Department of External Affairs many, many years ago in a different era. I joined the department uh, in 1971, and as Professor Carmody mentioned, um, I had the opportunity to serve Canada at the United Nations and uh, to appear with a number of other eminent, with other eminent people and in the International Court of Justice on behalf of, of Canada. There have been tremendous changes in what I call the discipline of international law over the years that I've been involved. When I started, at the former Department of External Affairs. International law was one of those rather esoteric subjects that lawyers in foreign ministries were engaged in and a handful of academics were engaged in. But I think it's fair to say that 
in those days, international law had not really entered the domain of Canadian domestic law. They were really two solitudes, not entirely, but largely two solitudes. What happened on the international legal level concerned interstate relations, and what happened in Canada was something quite different. It involved statutes and the common law, and there was not a lot of interface. Well, things have changed remarkably since those days. Just to mention a few, and I don't purport to give you an exhaustive survey, and time doesn't permit, but in the old days there were a handful of judicial decisions, Canadian judge-made <coughs> law, that brought international law into the domestic sphere, but a handful. The foreign legations case, which you may or may not be familiar with, uh, was one of them, but one of a handful. Things developed slowly, where judges made reference to public international law, uh, and used public international law, whether it be treaty or customary law, to inform their interpretation and application of Canadian law. And I'll just quickly mention those cases. You should look at them if you haven't uh, all already. Um, we had the, uh, the Newfoundland Continental Shelf refer Reference. Uh, we had the, um, we had the, um, uh, the, um, the National Corn Growers case. And over time, and I mentioned those only uh, briefly, over time, uh, we had uh, cases uh, like Baker and Canada, and more recently, Suresh and Canada, where the Supreme Court recognized that whether by way of treaty or otherwise, international law informed the application and interpretation of domestic law. I mention these cases only to show how public international law has entered the domestic sphere. And what it says to all of you who will someday be out in the world either as practitioners or otherwise, is that in everyday life, in the law of Canada, international law is very real and very meaningful, and you can't understand domestic law issues without knowing how those are impacted by a public international uh, law. Um, let me now, having talked about Canadian domestic law, let me now turn to the public international law sphere. And before I talk about um, where we're going, let's talk about the challenges that the international community is faced with. Those challenges have been brought to the fore by the recent election of Mr. Trump and by statements that he made that have really indicated very strongly where the U.S. is likely to go on a lot of the issues concerning rules of law in international relations. So what are the challenges now that face us, as I said, taking into account the recent election? Um, Anti-globalization forces are emerging that put into question rules of law that we had come to accept over the period uh, since the Second World War. 
the <clears throat> aftermath of the Second World War was a period of remarkable institution building through the Bretton Woods system, where the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the International Trade Organization, which became the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, produced a, a system of rules that governed global relations in one way or another for almost 60 years. Those rules and those institutions are now being assaulted and called into question. The second challenge, related to the first, uh, is the dispersion of consensus in the international community with the growth of newly industrialized states and the relative loss of influence and leadership on the part of the United uh, States. Like it or not, U.S. leadership in the world community has been critical over many years to the development of the rule of law and the progressive development of public uh, international law. It hasn't been consistent. It has diminished in recent years, partly because of the relative decline of U.S. power, but U.S. commitment and leadership has always been extremely important for the international community. Again, I say whether we recognize it or like it or not, institutions that produced remarkable stability in international relations were primarily the result of <coughs> U.S. leadership. Not entirely U.S. leadership, but it was there and it produced the fund, the bank, and the GATT. With the relative decline of influence on the part of the United States, and with the rise of newly industrialized states and a shattering of the consensus that had governed international trade and other relations for so long, illustrated by the collapse of the Doha Round, we have another series of destabilizing uh, factors that affect the ability of the international community to move forward with new rules uh, on a global basis. I also think, and this is somewhat incidental, but nonetheless a factor, I think a lot of the rules, and certainly on the trade side in the WTO, have been overlawyered and become overly legalized, which have had the effect of stultifying the dispute settlement system within the World Trade Organization. So the question we have now is whether the breakdown of the post-World War II consensus reduces minimizes or threatens the achievements of the law of the sea and the Uruguay round and the emergence of the World Trade Organization uh, and uh, its uh, ability to resolve uh, disputes uh, among, among uh, states. Um, I just want to mention uh, if you aren't all students of public international law, uh, distinction between conventional and customary international law. As you know, there are sources of international law reflected in the statute of the International Court of Justice. I'm going to talk about treaty-made rules, conventional law, 
and customary international law, which are the two major sources of international law that I want to address today. There are other, um, other sources uh, of law in the statute. Um, opinion of juris uh, and uh, decisions of uh, international bodies that apply rules of law are also sources in Article 38 of the statute, but I'm really not, I'm not going to get into that arcane uh, subject area. I'll leave it to professors of public international law to deal with those. I'm really talking about uh, conventional treaty-made law and customary law. I should say that back in the days when I was in the Foreign Service, and even today, there are many challenges in identifying what is truly customary international law. And we can perhaps in the discussion period talk a little bit about that. It has come up in very contemporary ways in investor state dispute settlement where there is a broad range of opinion as to what constitutes customary international law governing the treatment of investors and investments. That's a little bit removed from what I'm really addressing today, but I mention it because we are still uncertain about all of the elements that constitute customary uh, international law. So, I've talked about the challenges and the destabilizing forces. I've talked about the incorporation of public international law rules and principles into Canadian domestic law. Uh, talked about the search for rules, either conventional rules, treaty-made rules, or customary rules uh, as challenges facing public international lawyers. I want to now address another important development, in fact, uh, a remarkable historic development uh, in public international law. The classical period of international law, the classical period, is based on the Westphalian doctrine of sovereignty of states. And the classical period involved international law as only concerning interstate relations. Only the state, under the classical doctrine, the West Westphalian doctrine, was a subject of international law. And that was the classical approach to international law that continued, continued for three centuries. Things changed, things changed uh, in the Bretton Woods, what I call the Bretton Woods era, the post-World War II era, where new and progressive approaches to international law began to emerge that moved us from the purely Westphalian system of states only uh, being uh, the subject of international law, to appreciating that other, other actors, i.e. people, could also uh, be made subject to uh, international law. And that was exemplified most, most dramatically in the Nuremberg trials, where individuals were held to account for breaches of public international law, for principles related to war crimes and, if you like, decent human uh, behavior. Now, we've moved even further beyond that, where we now recognize that international law applies to individuals, for example, uh, in the investment area. You know, the investor state treaties, which give investors rights 
really broke the mold by providing that in a treaty, individuals would be given rights vis-a-vis -vis states. That's a major change from the Westphalian concept to the contemporary, uh, the contemporary uh, notions that laws at the international level, treaties, can provide rights of recourse uh, for individuals. And we see changes in a different way whereby uh, human rights conventions apply to individuals. Uh, the law of war crimes, exemplified by the International Criminal Court, subjects persons, individuals, uh, to international law requirements, rules, precepts. So we've seen, not only on the domestic side, but on the international side, major changes uh, in public international law, moving from, on the domestic side, an isolation of international law from domestic law, and now a melding of the two regimes, uh, moving away from the purely Westphalian doctrine of interstate, re interstate relations and sovereignty of states, and only states are made subject to international law, to international law now that gives rights and prescribes obligations that are enforceable against uh, individuals. So where, where, does this, where does this take us? I'm trying to set the stage for an appreciation of contemporary international law and what international lawyers uh, are pursuing in the quest for uh, rules and governing the relationship between states and, and peoples. Now I want to come to the two areas that are largely the focus of my remarks, the law of the sea and the law of international trade. Two areas which are so fundamental to peace and order in the world. Not the only things, I'm not addressing environmental law or climate change, all of which are very important, but are outside the scope of what I'm allowed to, to do today, and that is to address some very, uh, some very uh, um, exemplary areas, areas that I think reflect the thesis I'm advancing. So I'm, I'm not ignoring by any means the progress on the environmental side through the UNFCCC and through the Paris Agreement. Not minimizing those at all, but I want to talk about the law of the sea and the law of international trade. On law of the sea, <coughs> we've seen a move, an historic move, from the Westphalian uh, a notion to something uh, much more uh, progressive. The Law of the Sea Conference, which uh, was held from 1973 to 1982, resulted in a major treaty, the UN Law of the Sea uh, Treaty, UNCLOS III as it's called, and it moved the world to deal not just with areas of the sea adjacent to the coastal state, not just dealing with the territorial sea and the rights of innocent passage, but embracing a whole range of things like sovereign rights over the continental shelf and the maritime resources beyond the territorial sea. Very important, very important developments covering the uses of the seabed uh, and the establishment of institutions uh, such as the seabed authority to regulate the exploitation of the seabed beyond areas of national jurisdiction, extremely important development that in some respects is off the radar screen, subject to one point I'm going to mention in a moment, 
But that's just a reflection of the fact that the rules that were developed in UNCLOS 3 continue to provide stability and peace in the use of the world's oceans, by and large, by and large, accepted by those states that are parties to the convention and those that are not like the United States, but which govern themselves in accordance with the rules in the convention itself. The one exception, or the most important exception I'm going to mention is the dispute in the South China Sea, a highly destabilizing dispute which has geopolitical consequences that we all need to be concerned about, particularly with a new U.S. administration that may have a different appreciation of the rules than previous U.S. governments. But leaving the South China Sea aside, my thesis is that the Law of the Sea Conference has set out rules that continue to abide today and retain their validity today because they are followed and accepted by almost all the nations of the world. And whatever happens in the future, whether we have additional conventions, whether some states enter into disputes, we still have the rules that the convention establishes. And nations, states will be judged by those rules, just like China is judged by the rules in the Law of the Sea Treaty. We all recognize, quite clear, that China has not accepted the arbitration panel's decision on their claims to sovereignty in the South China Sea. That is most regrettable and, as I said, geopolitically potentially very destabilizing. But the Chinese position was determined on the basis of rules. And those rules, in my view, continue and survive regardless of discrete tensions and disputes in various parts of the world. An achievement of major proportions, an achievement of major proportions, an historic achievement in the progressive development of international law. And I say that even if, even if states can no longer come together in a consensus-based process like the Law of the Sea Convention, and even if today's world inhibits consensus building as we had in the Law of the Sea Conference, those rules are now part of the, of the international system and they survive and will continue and states will be judged by application of those rules, whether or not they agree to implement decisions such as China. Those rules abide. So my point when I deal with the law of the sea is whether we can replicate the consensus-based negotiating system, law of the sea, that, that existed in the 1970s, 80s. We have those rules and they are with us today and they will survive. I say the same thing about the rules of international trade. I started off this discussion by talking about the shattering of the consensus-based system uh, through a number of historic developments and culminating in last week's election, which calls into question whether there truly is the possibility of any international consensus on trade relations and on building new institutions, uh, developing new rules governing international trade. What happened in the Bretton Woods era was the agreement on the general agreement on tariffs and trade. It was supposed to be something called the International Trade Organization, but lo and behold, what else is new? The ITO was not approved by the U.S. Senate, and so we never did get 
an international trade organization, but we did get a contract, a treaty called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT, which govern international trade on a multilateral basis until it morphed into the World Trade Organization. We had a rules-based system. It wasn't perfect, and the dispute settlement process was not perfect, but we had a rules-based system that emerged after the Second World War based on general consensus and largely the result of American leadership in promoting rules uh, of international trade. All of this was culminated in the World Trade Organization and a whole new series in addition to the rules of the GATT under the WTO agreement. I don't believe, as with Law of the Sea, that the consensus approach that emerged from the Uruguay round and produced the World Trade Organization is likely ever to be replicated, at least for the foreseeable future. I see a shattering and a dispersal of consensus internationally, a retrenchment now on the part of the United States, we think, uh, to multilateralism and trade. So I don't believe that in the near future the Doha round will ever be resurrected or there will ever be something like the Uruguay round which produced the World Trade Organization. But we have the rules. And those rules continue. And whether or not new trade rounds can ever be instituted, the rules that emerge in 1994 from the Uruguay round reflected in the World Trade Organization agreement continue to abide as in the law of the sea. And they will survive, in my view, the short-term cataclysm cataclysms and unsettling events that the world faces. I mention, the, I mention these rules abiding because if you look at the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement, the, the Canada-Europe Trade Agreement, or even go back further to the Canada-US free trade agreement and then the NAFTA. Each of these are based upon the rules of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade and the World Trade Organization Agreement. These principles of non-discrimination, of national treatment, of bound tariff rates, of uh, prohibitions on import restrictions are all reflected in these subsequent agreements, whether they've been ratified or not, whether the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement ever comes into force, unlikely, any of the regional trade agreements and bilateral trade agreements around the world reflect these fundamental principles. So in a turbulent world, uh, with a lot of destabilizing events, with the emergence of new forces, including anti-globalization forces, the difficulties that the international community faces in achieving consensus and new rules, we have the examples, shining examples in my view, based upon the GATT, furthered in the WTO agreement, on international trade, we have the rules in the Law of the Sea Conference, that remain, and they remain in place, and they govern the relationship between, uh, between states. So where are we going from here? It's difficult to say. On the one hand, I'm pessimistic about the ability of the, of the world community to further develop new rules and to further the progressive development of public international uh, law. Very disturbing uh, 
to learn that the new US government may either withdraw from or remove its support for the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. That being said, my point is that rules that were developed in the 1980s and 1990s on international trade uh, and uh, on the law of the sea uh, continue to remain in force. And for those jurists, all of you, who follow uh, the law, whether you're in the profession, uh, in the practicing community, or uh, pursue other uh, endeavors, um, the quest remains to ensure coherence and integration of the law in every respect and all of the principles that we have now will remain and hopefully, hopefully, uh, with a bit of optimism, we can achieve other eras where the law will continue to unfold and be progressively developed. So those are my, those are my comments. Uh, I've tried to provide an overview of where I think public international law is and give an indication uh, of what the future holds. Thank you.